I'm Donald. Good morning to you all. It's great to be here, and I'm going to be talking about reusing microservices this morning. And as you can probably guess, unintended consequences aren't necessarily all that good, although there might be, might be one or two good stories along the way. I've enjoyed putting this together, and I hope you enjoy the roller coaster ride with me. Just an introduction. I'm a software developer. I've been building software for a living since the mid-90s, so I guess that makes me experienced by any reasonable definition. So experience is the thing that helps me recognize the mistakes I've made before when I make them again. <laughs> I work for Equal Experts in Cape Town. I've um, been there for about four years. And we have a number of services. So we, we describe our work in terms of services. I work mainly in what we call the deliver service, where we build and deploy um, valuable software to our customers using modern software engineering practices. But I also dabble in the scale service, which is about how we help organizations to get the best value out of their investment in new development teams. So as they add development teams to their organization, how do they get the best return? So I'm now working on a platform team for the first time. So now I'm working a bit more in the scale service than in the, develop, the deliver service where I'd worked before. So a quick overview. We'll start with the rationale for reusing microservices. Why would we want to do a thing? Maybe it seems, it seems obvious to you, but we'll just go over a few ideas there. And then I've built up a collage of my experience. So I've had some, a number of experiences with this kind of approach. And I've both kind of woven them together into one story, which is perhaps not necessarily true. It's a, a work of fiction, but it's built from events that really happened to me. So I didn't make up any of the events. I just kind of transformed them into one story. So I'll tell the story in a number of chapters. And at the end of each, story, in each chapter, we'll review that chapter with hindsight and see if there's anything that, uh, that we've learned from it. And what I tried to do was to think of some questions I would ask myself. So next time somebody asks me to reuse a microservice, would I have some new tools to use? Would I have some questions to ask? And perhaps based on the qu answers to those questions, I might make different decisions. For example, to run away, but also possibly to choose a different design. So here's a spoiler. These are the questions. So the questions are, how much do we, if we want to reuse a microservice, how much do we care about its model? How much do we care about how it works internally? Do we need to know? Is it important to us? Then we need to know, is it fine? The next question is, is it fine as it stands, or does it need changes? Do we need to change it for our new purpose? And if so, can we make the changes ourselves, or do, are we dependent on another team? Do we have autonomy to make the changes, or do we have a dependency? And if we have a dependency, is the team responsible for making those changes? Is our dependency team aligned to our project? Do they care about our project? Are they interested in it? Do they understand it? And these last two items, the alignment and the autonomy, are some of our conventional wisdom and equal experts about how we scale. So we say that when we add a new team to a development organization, that team needs to have alignment, which means they understand the business problem, they understand the constraints, they can make good decisions because of that alignment. And they also have to have autonomy. So that means they can do most of the work themselves without handing stuff over, without being dependent on another team. So we recommend that they have alignment and autonomy, and those are questions that we'll ask repeatedly. So I'll come back to these questions so often that you'll become very irritated with me. But I'd like to think that these are worthwhile things. I'm definitely going to ask these the next time I'm asked to do a project. So the rationale. Yeah, this might seem obvious. So the, uh, the traditional idea is that we package some business logic and a microservice. And then in order to save time and money, we reuse that microservice instead of re-implementing the business logic. And that really appeals to us as developers because we've been told from an early age not to repeat ourselves, not to copy and paste, to avoid duplication. So it's a very appealing rationale for us. We think it makes a lot of sense, and so we do it a lot. And we reuse as opposed to, obviously, building something new or potentially taking something that exists, copying it, forking it, making our own copy, 
and starting to develop it ourselves. So the story starts in the lockdown. So we had an online stationery store that we built. Our target market was those desperate parents who were sitting there watching their children playing with devices and watching screens the whole time. And we thought, what if we gave them something else? What if we gave them some stationery that they could use to do arty and crafty things? So this, this uh, online store was quite successful. Now the lockdown's finally well and truly over. And we thought, what about some physical stores? That, that online store has been successful. Maybe we can put some physical stores down and draw a different market. So we've acquired leases on two properties, and we're starting to refurbish, and we'd like to go live in nine months, six to nine months. And so we need some tills. So this is what the project is about. So we've bought an off-the-shelf point-of-sale system, and we have some new teams to do the work. So there's a work to install and configure the tills and to set up the software inside the till system. And then we have a team to do the integration with our existing online pricing service, which is what we want to reuse. So that's the story here. We have a store pricing team, which is in addition to the existing pricing team. And we affectionately know them as the back-end team. The initial design looks like this. So we have a till or a till system that invokes the new store pricing system, uh, service, which will then price the basket on behalf of the till. And in order to do that, it consumes the existing online pricing service with a few minor changes. So that pricing service is very stable and very mature. It has some very sophisticated business rules built in for fancy pricing. And it seems an obvious choice for reuse. That seems like that's why we've chosen it for, to do the pricing for the till system. So we have a meeting with the pricing team to discuss the API. And the first thing they point out is that they use, for their pricing, they use an internal ID for each product, which they call a stock keeping unit or the SKU. And we realize that in the store, we'll only have the barcode, which is printed on each product. So there's a problem there to resolve. How do we resolve that barcode to a SKU? And so the pricing team also says they're a bit stuck. They have some work that they need to do for the next few months. And they ask us if we can take on this work. So can we resolve the barcode to a SKU, pass them a SKU, and then they know what to do with it. So they suggest that we talk to the product catalog service team, because they're responsible for the product catalog service, which would be able to potentially resolve a barcode to a SKU. Graham's law is that a meeting always leads to another meeting. So we meet with the product catalog team to discuss their API, which is fine, a little clunky query string with a whole lot of parameters that don't mean anything to us. But at the end of it, we're going to add a barcode. They don't have that feature yet, but the team is available to implement it. And they say it's a minimal change. They're happy to do it. They think they can do it quickly. And they'd like to get started right away. So their API looks like this. Well, this is the, the initial model we're proposing. The tool says, the till still invokes the store pricing service to price its basket, but now the store pricing service goes to the product catalog to resolve the barcode to a SKU. But here's the first unintended consequence. There's a base price in the product, in the API of the product catalog service. So we think, what if we use that base price to make a start? We want to price an item. We now have a base price for each, for each item in the basket. We do want to apply more sophisticated rules, but it's a good start. And we think this will help us to test the tools right away. So we can do some integration, make some prices available to the tools. They can show some baskets to the customer. They can print some tool slips. But we take it a little bit further, and we think, what if we went live with this? Isn't this kind of an 80% implementation? We've got a price. We can show it to the customer. The customer can pay. We can print tool slips. And the base prices are printed on the shelves. So the, the sophisticated pricing rules that we have are just to apply discounts and to apply deals, that kind of thing. So we think about it for a while, and we discuss it with the product manager, and then we realize there's potential inconsistency between what we have in the store and what we have online, and this could lead to unhappy customers. 
And besides, the other 20% is available easily. All we need to do is integrate with the pricing service. So let's go ahead with the initial plan, but in the meantime, at least we can get some good testing done with the TIL service. So this is what our model looks like, coming back to those questions. What does our model look like? We have a product catalog which has an internal model that it uses to look up a barcode and resolve it to a product which includes a SKU and a base price. We don't really care about how it does that. We're not interested. It doesn't really affect our business. If all we want is we give them a barcode, they give us a product. Then we built our little model, a very simple store pricing service which just returns the base price. We're quite happy that we have a very simple model, we understand it, and the bits of the model that we don't understand, we don't need to understand. So far, two months have gone by. There's quite a lot of excitement because the initial integration has gone really well. Team, we pat ourselves on the back, we say, well done, we've got some momentum, we're making some progress. The model is simple. We, didn't, we had to make changes, but they're relatively small, the changes in the the service that we reused, which was the product catalog service. We didn't have much alignment. The product catalog service doesn't really understand what they're doing. Well, their team doesn't understand what we're doing, but they don't need to because they're just able to do that work in a few weeks. And we didn't sacrifice much autonomy to get the work done. So, good start. So now, the pricing team isn't ready. They said they would be ready within a few months, and those few months haven't gone by yet, so we're not surprised to hear that they're not ready. And so the product manager thinks of one feature they really want, which is a store-specific promotion. Now how this works is the manager of each store is able to design their own deals to bring customers into the store. So make their own, their own promotions, and they'll have a, an app that they can use, a web app, to manage the promotions, and then they'll be able to apply those promotions to the base prices that come out of the product catalog or later on to the prices that come out of the pricing service. And the design is very simple, it's kind of bread and butter back-end design, a store promotions database, a store promotions service which reads and updates that database, the web app, the store promotions management app that configures and manages the store promotions and then we have our old store pricing service, which is going to be able to retrieve those store promotions and apply them to the baskets. So this goes really well. This is kind of what the back-end team loves to do. And they do this quickly, and they implement it and test it with the branch staff, and everybody's happy. And the model looks like this. So probably obvious to you, but the, what, we, what I said now, the till asks the store pricing service for a price, it gets the base price from the product catalog based on the barcode, and then it looks up store promotions that apply and sends the resulting basket back to the till. Now, the team is, the pricing team still isn't ready. So the back-end team thinks of some non-functional requirements they'd like to address. So they think of the obvious ones of resilience and performance, and they consider these design patterns of asynchronous architecture, retries, caching, perhaps some circuit breakers. Think about how to address the requirements they've come up with for resilience and performance. And we eventually choose to do caching and retries, which go really quickly. So now we've come to the end of our store promotions little chapter. We were able to do that with complete autonomy. We weren't dependent on anybody. And we're very happy about that. But now there's some lingering doubts in our minds about what we've done. We realize that this store-specific promotions feature doesn't feel like a version one feature. It feels a bit like a nice to have, not so MVP feature. And we know we've had some experience of this. We know we'd like to release that MVP first, get it into production with paying customers, learn something from it before we add features like this, this feature. Also, we're a little uncomfortable with the optimization that we've done because it feels a bit premature. We don't really understand the service that we've built yet, but still, we're optimizing it. But the biggest doubt we have in our mind is nothing's in production yet. We've been working for five months, and we don't have anything in production, and we know that just leaves us feeling really uncomfortable. Pricing team is not ready. 
So there have been a few delays, there have been a few extra features that they've had to build. They're about to get started. So the product management realizes they have, they don't want to leave the back-end team idle. They don't want to leave us doing nothing. We're expensive. We must produce something. So we're going to produce some targeted marketing. When I tell you the names of the target marketing categories I've come up with, you'll realize I've never worked in this domain. So the initial targeted target market for our online store was the crafty kids. The kids who are going to be doing something useful and creative instead of watching TV. But another category emerged over time, which is the parents of these kids or other adults who like to use the same things to do arts and crafts on their own, perhaps at the end of a long day of working at home. And we call them the arty adults. But now that we have our own stores, we imagine a third category of customer, those who are walking past the store and they remember, I need some printed paper, I need some pens, I need some whiteboard markers. These are people who are working and who are walking past. So we call them the walk-in workers. And we want to develop a new category for them and be able to identify them so that we can send targeted marketing messages to them. So the design is quite simple. The till already emits events to say a payment has been made and each event contains the details of the basket. And so we will implement a payment handler to handle those events, a new thing, a new service that we'll implement. And then that will pass, transform the events into what the targeted marketing service, the existing service, expects and send them off to the targeted marketing service. And that service has been developed in a pluggable way by a team that no longer exists. So that team has been disbanded. The people, some people have left the organization, some people have been deployed to other teams, but they've built this pluggable thing and apparently it's really easy to write a plugin for the targeted marketing service. So we get going. We implement the plugin, we build the payment handler, we start sending events to the targeted marketing service, we craft the baskets that typically and perfectly would identify the walk-in workers but we don't get any. Where are our walk-in workers? We have to think hard. We have to go and find those developers who used to work, work on the service. We have to go and read the code. And we discover that there's a chain of responsibility pattern here. What that means is that the payment is offered first to the set of rules that would identify a crafty kit. Only if that rule that, that doesn't apply, only if it isn't a crafty kit, do we attempt to identify an RT adult. If, only if we don't identify an RT adult do we attempt to identify a walk-in worker. One of the assumptions that was made by the team was it's harmless to have false positives on RT adults because they can just opt out of the targeted marketing message. And besides, our initial market was the crafty kids and if we can identify anybody in the other category, we're doing well. We've got a bonus. So they've implemented it in a way that is very generous and very open to RT adults and a whole lot of false positives are being generated to the point where the new walk-in worker category is completely crowded out. So we don't identify any. The team's still kind of scratching its head about how to, do, how to resolve this problem. If they make the RT adult rules uh, but too, a bit more specific, that has an effect on the initial rationale for making it permissive. But if they don't, they don't get any walk-in workers. So there's an idea to rethink how this works, maybe break the chain of responsibility, implement a point system, but the team's still thinking. At the end of it, it wasn't really a great success, this chapter. The team's a bit demotivated. But most importantly, they feel that they've built something that had nothing to do with what their domain was. They were just starting to understand the pricing. We were just, we were just getting excited about that, and now we were asked to do this thing which didn't really make sense to us. And there's an IEEE article on on-time delivery that I was looking at, which says 15% of delays on projects can be explained by this kind of poor alignment. One of the other question is changes. So we, we had changes, there were small changes to make, we thought they were small, ended up being much bigger. We had autonomy of a kind because we could do it on our own, we weren't dependent on another team, but we were working in an area that wasn't familiar to us. And the most important mistake we made was we thought we didn't need to understand the model. 
but the model was really important and it contained subtleties that we didn't understand. For example, that false positives were harmless. In our environment, false positives were quite harmful. It was the, the story that I based this on was when I was, well, I was having a quite enjoyable business trip overseas, being wined and dined by a supplier. And my code was busy emitting false positives somewhere else in the world. And I had to get over there quickly, stop drinking whiskey, and get over and, get so and sort out the problem in another country. So this hurt me directly. <coughs> Eight months have gone by. The pricing team is available. Let's get on to the main event. So remember, we had that initial meeting. Rewind the clock. We met with the pricing team, and we spoke about what changes would be required to their service. So the first change is a branch-specific price. So these branches are geographically distributed. They're in different market segments, and they are different distances from the warehouse. So ideally, we'd like to have slightly different prices in these different stores, and those rules would ideally be applied by the pricing service. Then we have online promotions, which apply to the online store, and we wouldn't like those promotions to be applied to the in-store purchases. And then we also have dynamic pricing algorithms, which change the prices of items in near real time. We definitely don't want those being applied to the store. That would be very confusing. So these are the changes that are required to the pricing service. And the pricing team imagines they'll take about three months to do them once they've finished the other work in their backlog. So in the meantime, while they're busy with their backlog, we, the back-end team, think we'd like to work around the problem. And we think about writing some mocks or some stubs just to send some canned data back to the tools. But we don't have to do that because we had this brilliant discovery of the base price. So we make that available, and that lets us to make progress on the integration and the testing. But once we've completed the integration with the product catalog service, we think, what if we use the SKU that we have to invoke the existing pricing service? So that'll take us another step along the way towards the integration. OK, so the pricing service isn't quite what we would have wanted. It doesn't have these changes that we require. But it would at least help us to get experience with the API to make sure it all works. So we do that, we complete the integration, we start testing. So it works pretty well for a while, and then we get null prices back for some of the products. We just don't get a price. So we think there must be a problem in our code. We spend a few days trying to debug it. And then eventually we bump into one of the developers of the pricing service on a Zoom call, and we say, hey, we're getting null prices back. Does that sound familiar to you? And he, he chuckles, and he says, oh, yes. The inventory check. And we, we say, the what? And he says, obviously, we don't want to give prices back for items that we don't have in stock. So we don't want to display the prices. So that rule has been implemented in the pricing service. So we blank out the prices for items that are not in stock. So we're dumbfounded. And we say, well, surely that doesn't apply in the store. And they say, no, of course not. So that's another change that we have to make to the pricing service to make sure that we, it will work in the store environment. So at this point, the back-end team, we are feeling very frustrated. We've now been waiting for a long time to start integration with, with the service. There's another item that they have to work on. We're feeling demoralized. We're not making progress with the product with, the, with the, the project, and we're feeling pressure. We need to go, we need to go live, we need to open the stores, and we, the, we the back-end team, are holding you back. So we start speaking up. There's kind of a lot of frustration bubbling out. And the pricing team gets wind of this, and they realize that this is directed at them, although they're completely powerless as well. They've been told what their priorities are. They're doing the best that they can to deliver on time. And this bad feeling that develops between the teams. People feel grumpy and don't want to talk to each other anymore. Friendships break down. People leave. The pricing team is delayed even more because people leave. Just another little chapter is the caching problem. So remember we did the premature optimization where we implemented the cache? What went wrong here? So initially we thought, 
we can look up a barcode and we can resolve it to a product which includes a base price and we can cache that base price and then we don't have to keep on looking it up every time. The world will be a better place. But then we realized that some things like two for the price of one promotions. So you can't look up that barcode and get the same price every time. You need to cash against the barcode and the quantity. So we implement a cache that does that. And that's all working fine until the pricing service comes along and shows us that if you buy this item, you can get this item for a lower price. And then the cache is completely invalidated. So remember we said, we talked about the model, we said, we don't really, maybe we don't need to understand the pricing model. We didn't understand the pricing model. And because of that, we implemented a design that didn't really make any sense at all, given the, the pricing model, but that's because we didn't understand it. Now we have a pricing model that looks like this at the end of the integration. So we say, did I miss a slide there? I missed a few. Um, Sorry, go back a bit. Right, so the pricing service, we, there were big changes to the pricing service. Uh, we did them without any autonomy. There wasn't much alignment from the pricing team. And we spoke a little bit in that caching discussion about the model and how we misunderstood it. So let's talk a bit more about that. So the model that we've come up with is this. Uh, we have our till asking the store pricing service for the price of its basket. We have that going to the pricing service, which then has store-specific rules and other old rules that have been around for a while. And um, on the left-hand side at the top, we have online promotions which have been bypassed. So this is the model which seems quite sensible, perhaps, until we superimpose this view. So what we've done is we've said the top half of the model belongs to the pricing team, and the bottom half of the model belongs to the store pricing team. And I can see some people laughing, which I think is because they remember this old law and what it's going to do to us. So if you, Conway said in 1967, in his first law, he said, a system design reflects the design of the organization that made it, or the organizational structure, and specifically the communication structures in that organization. Nobody's immune to Conway's law, and we weren't. So our design starts to look like this. Our model said, we have this pricing domain, and in the middle of it, we have this big gap, which is this new communication, this API, this important interface that we've, Conway's law was imposed on us. We have split the bounded context across the, the pricing team and the store pricing team. So now those people live in different worlds. They're inside their world, they understand their model really well, but they're two different models. And so what that means is there's confusion between the teams. They haven't identified this interface in the middle. They're not thinking of it as a, a first class citizen in the architecture. And they're making mistakes because they think they have one model, but they actually have two. So the end result is, uh, I missed a slide, I just want to talk about that. So we talked about online promotions. Um, so the online promotions became a problem too, because we said we wanted to split out the online promotions from, we wanted, we wanted the store pricing to be independent of those, so those mustn't apply to the store prices. But what turned out to be really difficult is to identify the online promotions and to separate them from any other kind of promotion which would then apply in both domains, so to the store pricing and the online pricing. And that became a big problem for the pricing team. They hadn't anticipated this. They thought they'd be able to bypass online promotions, but they only had the option to bypass all promotions or to bypass no promotions. And they had to extend their data model so that they could identify, or make, make a distinction between them. And this was a big delay in the project as well, why they did that work. Anyway, the end result is after months of testing and fixing, we have a successful delivery. It's quite, quite late. It's a year and a half instead of six to nine months. But the stores are opened. Everybody's excited. There's great fanfare. 
So let's talk about some of the un unintended consequences that we had along the way. So we had delays. It may seem a bit crazy, it may sound like a stuck record about how the pricing team continued not to be ready. But I think this is a familiar thing, where the, that team is busy with something, that they've got their, their mission. Their mission is to do online pricing. That work never stops. They're always having to do that work. And while we're waiting for them to do that, we will be delayed. I've experienced that a few times. The, the rationale for doing, for reusing the microservice in the first place was to save cost and time. But we seem to have increased the amount of time we've required and to increase the cost. The morale of both teams has been damaged and possibly destroyed. And we've built a model which includes nice to have features that turn out to be a lot more complicated than we expected. So the model has been un unnecessarily complex while we're doing the initial integrations. And so part of the problem with that is that things became quite difficult to debug. So when, there's, when we're doing some testing and we get a price that isn't quite as we expected, where in the model has it broken down? How do we debug that? Has that gone wrong in the pricing service, which then goes and does the, its sophisticated rules or its store-specific uh, store promotions? Has it gone wrong in the cache? So do, have we cached an old value? That becomes very difficult. And so the, the team ends up building a whole lot of integration tests to try and isolate these kinds of problems and to, re to repeat these tests so that we can identify the problems when they come up again. But it's very hard to debug because the models become so complex over time, unnecessarily complex. So we took it, and then the final thing is that model is split. So by the time we finish the project, there's another lingering doubt about how maintainable this is because we have a model split across two teams. We really have two models. And over time, we know that's going to become quite difficult to maintain and to add to. And that's, in fact, what we experienced. So the teams continue to have friction because they're not talking about one model. They're talking about two. And in fact, we want pricing to be one model for the stores. But now we've got this complex interaction between the online pricing model, the store pricing model, and some kind of consistent model in between. So coming back to those questions to ask, I'll repeat them. So do we need to care about the model of the microservice we intend to reuse? Do we need to make changes to that microservice, or is it fine as it is? If we need to make changes, can we make them with autonomy? And if not, is there alignment between us and the team that needs to make the changes? I'm hoping that these questions will help me next time to avoid the same mistakes. Imagine that we do. What would I do? So we have these options. We could invent something new. We could make a copy. Or maybe we could find some happy medium where we reuse something and we choose to build something else from scratch. So perhaps the important moment in the story was when we decided to push on with the integration with the pricing service. There was an opportunity for us to think differently there and to say, we're going to build up our own pricing model. It's not, as, not sophisticated yet, but it will become sophisticated over time. We, we could build it from a very simple starting point and build it up to the point where it is what we want it to be. But in the meantime, we could make progress. I think that's what I would do now. So reuse of microservices seems seductive and simple. And often it is. So I, I don't want to move away from that. I don't want to deny that. Sometimes, many times, it makes sense to reuse a microservice, especially when it's been designed for reuse. But maybe before attempting it, we could just use these simple questions to think a bit more deeply about the problem and make sure we don't fall into these unintended consequences. Any questions? Uh, did you ever think of merging the teams for the period of time you needed? There was def uh, the question was, did we think of merging the teams temporarily? It definitely was a, a, a consideration. Because of the pressure from the online pricing requirements, the ongoing pressure changes, problems that they were experiencing, they didn't want to 
they needed them to be prioritized that work. And so they weren't able to merge the teams and to focus entirely on this project. So that's why it was resisted. Mm. Do business considerations play into this? As a business, I'm, you know, from the business side, I want the store pricing and the um, online pricing. To, I want some of those rules to agree, and I don't want to have too much drift in how we do pricing across different parts of the business. Where does that come into the equation? Yeah, so that was a key moment in the in the story was the point where the development team says, why can't we just use the base price that we have from the catalog? And one of the most important answers to that is there'll be discrepancies between the, the price in the store and the price online, and that might lead to some unhappy customers. So the, there was, that was a business argument for saying, let's not do that. Let's rather aim for the integration to complete so that we can maintain this consistency across the business. Hi, um, great talk. Um, just a question. So one of the key features in why we build microservices is so it's uh, quicker to make changes. So how micro was the pricing microservice that it took months to deliver a change? Yeah, that's a very good question. So it wasn't as micro as we would have hoped. It was, it had two, it, it definitely had, so there was, there was packaged business logic, but the package was too big. Um, and then also, but the biggest problem that they faced was this disentangling of the, of the promotion. So it seemed like a simple project, and they really thought they could do it in a short amount of time. And the only reason they didn't, the initial reason they didn't complete it on time was that they were delayed by these other online concerns. But then the biggest delay they experienced was this, their model for, for promotions was difficult to disentangle. And perhaps that, that, there's a, a smell there that says maybe it should be refactored into two services. After all it's been said and done, the, the business requirement that was given, like the prices have to agree, in the end they don't have to agree at all because the store prices are completely different to the online prices. And the person in the store doesn't necessarily care what the online price is. Exactly. Yeah. So that was, you know, that was a decision that the business made at that point to say that was important. And there was kind of a discussion about that and an agreement to say, well, the domain experts need to be trusted, and they say this is important. Perhaps from the pricing service, it, it then that what it could have been basically should have just been analyzed by business in terms of business analysis to see we are wanting a change in the intended use of that. And that may have either avoided or led you to make um, some of the better decisions, perhaps. Yeah, so to, to say, it's a similar question, right? To say, the, the microservices package is too big, that, that there's an opportunity to build something new that addresses a different concern. So that does make sense. So to say that, the, that to burden it with the two responsibilities, the online pricing responsibility and the store pricing responsibility seems too much for one microservice, too many concerns. So I definitely agree with that. And we didn't spot it at the time only became clear later. I think we've got time for one more question. To, to the other, because, um, I mean, in sort of following up on the previous question, you don't want to take the risk of potentially compromising the online business, but you do want to get the store business up and running as soon as possible. So maybe an approach of, by default, getting the online price and then kind of intercepting it and augmenting it based on rules and, you know, putting that through to its all, because then you have the new interface, and you can, you know, these two things can, you can sort out the mess in between with the benefit of having some, some time. Oh, so, so you say to complete the initial integration with the existing service so, so and I'm then saying, to modify the prices on the way out. Yeah, so what I'm saying is the, the store service is basically just a facade on top of the existing service, mm. maybe applying some rules um, in line. Yeah, so I think that was, that was the moment when we hit those null prices and we realized that something was so broken there that we couldn't recover. So there was a plan to say, let's use that service as is and live with it until we got to a point where we couldn't. But yes, I think that would be definitely the kind of design that I would consider next time. So put a facade down, it's a kind of a strangler pattern of um, use the existing legacy service until it doesn't push it until you can strangle it out. 
I think that's it. We've run out of time. Thanks very much.